Hello, everyone. Um, it's Ulrich Sidney here, president of the Association of Future African Neurosurgeons and research associate at the program Global Surgery and Social Change at Harvard Medical School. Um, today, we have a very interesting presentation on the acute decompression, um, acute manage management of acute body decompression of the optic nerves and um, other cranial nerves. Uh, this will be presented by Aselda Nyalunja. Uh, before we start, we're going to have um, uh, every panelist present themselves. So, um, Dr. Musindo, can you please present yourself? Um, you're, you're on mute, Dr. Musindo. Can you mute? Yes. Yes. I, I am Musindo, resident of neurosurgery in Mozambique. Okay, N um, nice to have you. Um, thank you so much. Uh, Marvin, can you present yourself, please? Yeah, hi everyone. I'm Dr. Marvin, uh, PGY1 Neurosurgery, Ivory Coast. Okay. Um, okay, um, thanks. Great. Um, now, um, Arsen, you, you can go ahead and present yourself and start the presentation um, as soon as you. Okay, hello everyone. I'm Arsen Daniel from uh, Catholic University of. Bukavu and a medical student in the final year. Today we are presenting a amazing subject which is called acute bony decompression of the optic nerve. So at the plan for this presentation, we'll have an overview and epidemiology, the anatomy of the optic nerve, pathophysiology of the optic nerve, evaluation of traumatic nerve injury and neuroimaging assessment management of the traumatic nerve injury and then we'll conclude at the end of this presentation so at the first point the traumatic optic neuropathy is a devastating potential complication of closed head injury the all mark of an optic neuropathy traumatic otherwise is a loss of visual function, which can manifest by subnormal visual acuity, visual field loss or the color vision dysfunction. Visual loss, uh, visual loss associated with the traumatic optic neuropathy can be partial or complete and temporary or permanent. The trauma can participate in various pathophysiological conditions that ultimately manifest as the visual dysfunction. The trauma induced uh, injury to the optic nerve can occur anywhere along the nerve uh, as in intraorbital to the intracranial length of the optic nerve. The uh, direct trauma, traumatic optic neuropathy is a term used when the optic nerve is, uh, is lesion, crushed or transcended. These injuries are usually the result of the cranial trauma such as penetrating ground or extensive crash injury with displaced cranial facial fractures. Indirect traumatic optic neuropathy occurs when the, in the absence of the direct nerve injury and is common than the direct traumatic optic neuropathy. Historically, three, uh, the three treatment paradigm advocate for the traumatic op optic nerve neuropathy are observation, medical corticosteroid therapy, or the canal decompression. Transcranial and roofing of the optic canal or surgical procedure of the choice, a transethmoidal optic canal decompression, which is generally performed by removing the lamina papyrusae and medial wall of the optic canal. Also, this technique was refined by progressive advance in transnasal, trans antral, transorbital, and the extra, external paranasal sinus surgery. Recent advent in uh, endoscopic instruments and intranasal sinus surgery technique have been refined extracranial surgical approaches for trauma optic neuropathy. Endoscopic nerve decompression via intranasal and transethmoidal or transphenoidal approaches had gained popular supports. According to the epidemiology, in the U.S., the incidence of indirect traumatic optic neuropathy is approximately uh, 
two uh, plus uh, 2.5% in patients with mid face trauma and two up to five patients with closed head injury. Internationally, the incidence of indirect traumatic optic neuropathy in the Western world is reportedly uh, according to 0.7 up to 5%. Most cl clinical surveys in Western literature involve a fewer than 40 patients. Higher incidence of indirect traumatic of uh, higher incidence of indirect traumatic neuropathy is reported in some Japanese studies. However, reason remain unclear. The UK literature, literature reports that the vast majority of traumatic optic neuropathy patients are young males, uh, up to uh, 79 to 85, with a mean age of 34, uh, 34 years. Traumatic optic neuropathy is commonly caused by motor vehicle, bicycle accident, and falls are the next common cause followed by physical violence and recreational supports. The optic, now we are going to discuss the anatomy of the optic nerve. And the optic nerve, as we know, is a central nervous system fiber pathway connecting retina to the brain. The two optic nerves exist, uh, exit from the optic canals and rise at an angle about 45 degrees to unite to unit the, at the optic chiasm. There are nearly 1.0 million ganglion cells and their axons that make up the optic nerve and about 90 of fibers in each optic nerve arise from the macula. The nerve is 1.5 millimeter by 1.8 millimeter vertical ellipse and it appears as a pink to yellow which this myelin in the optic nerve is formed by oligodendroglia. The axons are unmyelinated in the retina and the papillary surface, but became myelinated at the posterior and the end at the posterior end of the optic nerve head as they pass through one of the 200 to 300 holes in the lamina fibrosa. The optic nerve extends from retina to the optic chiasm. It's approximately uh, five centimeters, centimeters long. Conventionally, it's divided into four parts. Uh, the first is an intraocular, which lends one millimeter, and it uh, corresponds to the disc. We have at the second position an intraorbital uh, part of the optic nerve, which is about uh, 25 millimeters. To the third position with the intracranicular uh, portion of the optic nerve, which is about 19 millimeters length, and at the last position we have intracranial portion of the optic nerve. Uh, it's also important to note that the optic artery and some filaments of the sympathetic carotid plexus accompany the nerve through the optic canal. And this canal is located within the lesser ring of the sphenoid, which is one of the bones that comprise the orbital roof. The optic canal is separated from the superior orbital fissure by the optic strut of the sphenoid bone. Hence, the optic strut comprises the optic canal lateral wall. The canal's medial wall separates it from the sphenoid Sinus. And here we have a, so the next slide, please. And here we have a picture which will add the, the different parts of the optic nerve. As we say, the, the points corresponding to A is what we call the intraocular part of the Orbital, uh, this part corresponds to the disc at, as we said previously. And uh, the parts, uh, the parts which correspond to the, the B segment, which is this is the intra orbital part of the, the optic nerve. And the C, which is between two blue landmarks, 
correspond to the intra intracanacular portion of the orbital nerve and the last part correspond to the intracranial part of the orbital nerve. Now we are going to discuss about the pathophysiology of the optic nerve injury. It is important to know that the, the exact pathophysiology of the traumatic optic nerve neuropathy is poorly understood until now, but the common hypothesis, the common theory according to the optic nerve neuropathy is associated with the fracture of the orbital complex. In some cases, no fracture can be identified, especially in post-traumatic nerve dysfunction. And the most common mechanism of the, opt, uh, the post-traumatic optic neuropathy is likely a compressive edema over scleral insufficiency. Other mechanisms, hemorrhage and laceration of the intracanicular optic nerve by, frag, by fracture fragment was described in some literatures. Optic nerve lesion was classified into primary and secondary by Walsh. And traumatic optic neuropathy in its most common form is an indirect event that occurs during uh, or shortly after blunt trauma to the, tip, to the superior orbital rhyme, lateral orbital rhyme, or to the frontal area or in the cranium. Now we are going to discuss about the six categories of the optic nerve injury who was described in literature. Uh, these six categories include laceration, bony deformation or fracture, vascular insufficient, contusion, concussion, and hemorrhagia. A scam is, is considered the secondary event that gives rise to the neuropathy the cellular and the subcellular events that constitute the mechanism of neural damage are only now being realized. realized. The role of oxygen, uh, free radicals, enzyme, cytokine, intracellular calcium, and other forms of the reperfusion damage are slowly being uncovered through the basic science research. A less common form of traumatic optic neuropathy that involves the intracranial optic nerve results from forces del delivery, delivered by the brain shift at the moment of the impact. The rationale for medical and surgical treatment of an injury traumatic neuropathy stem from the belief that trauma creates a mechanical sharing on a proportion of retinal ganglion cell axon and subsequent edema of the optic nerve. This uh, swelling within the rigid confines of the bony optic canal got further trauma to the previously undamaged retinal ganglion cell, and it makes some perturbating in the vision loss, therefore in a theory decre decreasing this swelling and may halt further damage at the a limit secondary damage to the optic nerve. Here we have uh, a kind of image. It, uh, it is from, uh, it is an MRI image which shows some fractures of the orbital complex for uh, a young, a young old man who sustained orbital and traumatic foramen fractures. To the e image, where we have an orbital apex fracture in region of the optic foramen, while a row, and the image on, posi on B position show a fracture in, ma in medial and lateral orbital wall fractures. The, la the lateral orbital fra fracture wall, wall fracture is impinging the lateral rectus muscle. According to the evaluation of the optic nerve, according to the evaluation of the uh, traumatic optic nerve injury, the, the diagnosis of traumatic optic neuropathy is first clinical. The patient with mid-facial and cranial trauma should 
be a, a nice index of suspicion of traumatic optic neuropathy. Although in some cases, patients with optic nerve injury may have no visible sign of traumatic injury. And features of traumatic neuropathy include ocular involvement, reduced visual acuity, pupillar defect, impairment of color vision, variable visual field defect, and changes in the optic disc appearance on the fundoscopy. An initial assessment of visual acuity for each eye is possible and is very crucial. Unfortunately, con con concomitant head and facial injury often complicate the initial evaluation of, of visual acuity following head trauma. And indirect injuries to the optic nerve can be classified into anterior and can be classified into anterior and posterior. A comprehensive of thalamic examination for patients in whom the traumatic optic neuropathy is suspected includes the following assessment uh, ocular adnexa, visual acuity, papillary reaction, and intraocular pressure at the lad a ophthalmoscopy. According to Edmund and Gutfredson, decreased direct pupillary response to light is stated is, is not as the most reliable index of optic nerve compromise. While unlateral optic nerve injury, the initial pupillary size is equal bilaterally. However, upon direct light stimulation of the impaired eye, uh, pupillary constriction occurs more slowly and to a lesser degree or not at all than if uh, the stimulus had been applied to the normal eye. I assume optic nerve dysfunction when a loss of, uh, when a loss of uh, best corrected visual acuity or visual fit is accompanied by a nipsilateral relative apparent pupillary defect. Uh, that is called the uh, Marcus Gunn Papi. This is not reliable when the patient has bilateral insults. It is important to know that, however, uh, that if bilateral optic neuropathy is present, uh, however, but injury is present, a uh, uh, pupillar defect, uh, this we call the Marcus Gunn PP, may be more subtle or not be present at all. But visual evoked res response and electroretinogram may be provide additional information to guide long-term clinical management. Good correlation between the initial uh, visual evoked response and ultimate visual acuity has been described. And in some settings, the visual evoked response may be superior to the clinical assessment in determining outcome of visual acuity. Greenberg and all describe a 90% predictive accuracy with visual evoked response testing as opposed to a third person with clinical examination in series of patients with retrovular dysfunction examined within three days of insult and again it's three months or longer. And now we are going to discuss about the neuroimaging assessment of the optic, the, the optic nerve neuropathy. The procedure of choice is a thin section computed tomography as it a low resolution of the bony detail of the orbital apex region. A thin section CT scan also provides an intraoperative road map of the surgeon in patients who require surgical decompression. Axia, axial and coronal CT scans can be obtained. It is may, may demonstrate orbital fractures and bony fragments. Surgeons who wish to perform image-guided optic canal decompression 
need to obtain a special order CT scan that is formatted to their computerized stereoactic localizing system. Reconstructed image including three dimension view and this can also assist in detailed evaluation of facial and orbital entries. It must be remembered, however, that the, it has been reported that comprehensive bone fragment uh, not observed on peruptive CT imaging have been found at operation. CT scan provide adequate imaging of orbital soft tissue and is better than MRI at the delineating bony defect. Magnet, uh, MRI may, may demonstrate soft tissue injury and hemorrhagia or hematoma within the dural sheet or, or opti, of the optic nerve. According to the management of the traumatic optic nerve, it is important to know that uh, the mostly accepted contemporary treatment for traumatic optic neuropathy have include observation, steroid and surgical decompression, but concern about the use of corticosteroid in patients with acute brain trauma is led to recent recommendation not to treat traumatic optic neuropathy with steroids. Corticosteroids play a prominent role in the management of uh, an optic nerve injury, and the most regime calls for initial uh, loading dose of 30 mg per kilo followed by 15 mg per kilo infused every six hours for three days. Several injuries, uh, several theory utilizing corticosteroid support substantial improvement of visual acuity. In one meta-analysis, in one metal ion treatment, a corticosteroid extracranial decompression or corticosteroids plus extracranial decompression improve visual acuity than observation alone. And no difference between treatment and modality could be found. In contrast, there are other series that do not show any benefit for steroids over observation, most prominently the report from the International Optic Nerve Trauma. Now, uh, most international optic, sorry, more, uh, most international optic nerve trauma study was conceived to compare extracranial optic nerve, the compressive surgery, plus corticosteroid uh, with corticosteroids alone. Unfortunately, a relevant of eligible, eligible patients was insufficient to provide a statistical validity. The study was changed to an observation study, and the result of this study suggested no difference in traumatic optic nerve injury outcome between observation and uh, between observation corticoid and the compressive surgery group. And in 2011, a review was published in the American Journal of Ophthalmology that concluded that high dose steroids could be harmful when given to head trauma patient for optic nerve injury. The review also concludes that surgery should be reserved for conscientious patients with delayed visual loss or whose vision does not improve in four days. In one meta-analysis, any treatment, uh, uh, according to corticosteroid, extracranial decompressive or corticosteroid uh, plus extracranial decompression, improve visual acuity more than observation alone. And uh, the indication for optic nerve decompression, uh, uh, we can list the duration of visual loss activity during or after corticosteroid treatment. Uh, optic kernel compressive fragment, uh, this must be discovered on imaging, uh, uh, on imaging uh, as it's mentioned. And the other indication for the compression of optic nerve, uh, take into consideration decreased vision persisting up to one year after injury. Some literature, uh, such as Emmanuel and colleague, uncounted 
26 patients in a 10 years period with traumatic optic neuropathy and all patients were treated with system steroids. All patients require a surgical treatment because of poor response to medical therapy. It consisted of an endonasal endoscopic decompression of the optic nerve and improvement of visual acuity was achieved in 65% of the cases. No complication occurred with follow-up time of 24 one month. An important of visual acuity was achieved, although very limited in some cases when surgery was performed as close as possible to the traumatic event. They conclude that the surgical decompression of a best outcome for patients in medical therapy uh, failed and if surgery is done within 12 to 24 hours. Several, uh, several reports document improved visual equity outcome for the compression performed within seven days of injury compared with the compression performed after seven days. Other studies have not found this time or this period to be a significant factor in visual outcome. And no agreement as to whether the presence of such a structure is prognostic of the visual outcome. Some report document was visual outcome in patients with suffering orbital apex fractures whereas others find no difference in outcome between patients with and without such fractures. Such as, uh, the surgical approach is dictated by the mechanism of the, and the location of the insult, as well as the associated injury, especially uh, associated fracture. Uh, that is, uh, and then we are speaking uh, about the fracture of the orbital complex uh, in a context of head trauma. The presence of fracture will lead to a best selective surgical approach on the basis of the type of the fracture and the direction of compression if this can be determined by preoperative radiologic study. In the absence of clear pathology, adequate decompression of the cranial uh, adequate, adequate compression of the cranial uh, of the canal should be possible regardless of the direction of the approach. And it is pointed to note that there are various approaches for cranial nerve decompression, and we can list some of them. The the main categories of the, the optic nerve decompression, such as the transfrontal approaches the transethmoidal approaches and the lateral approaches. According to the, the, the first one, which is a transfrontal approaches, it is important to know that these approaches uh, it is important to know that uh, this approach, uh, the transfrontal approaches was dictated in uh, 19... 22 by Dandy for orbital tumor and is frequently utilized. Uh, this approach a low to exposure to is this approach a low to exposure, particularly uh, the intracranial path pathology and requires surgical attention. According to the transethmoidal approach. According to the transcranial approach, this was originally described in uh, 1926 by Sewell and was popularized and modified by Neo and all and some surgeons like uh, Foucault and Tofferman and others. Uh, the benefits of this approach is uh, it avoids a craniotomy and provides exposure of the major orbital apex to the fracture of the lateral wall, it can help to minimize the morbidity. At last, we have the lateral approach. According to the transfrontal approach, as we said, it's a low to visual the optic nerve and the optic cusp. 
In case of frontotemporal injury, inspection of intracranial optic nerve, optic chasm, and posterior aspect of the optic canal is due to the axis of this structure. Dual truss and orbital plate fracture can be repressed and associated intracranial pathology can be addressed concurrently. The optic canal can be unroofed and the dural sheet of the optic nerve decides to allow adequate decompression and incision of the optic nerve. This technique has been described and utilized by main author and has been leveled by Soferman as a standard surgical technique upon which virtually all reported theory of optic nerve decompression are based. And on this image, we, it shows us the transfrontal optic nerve decompression via a right frontal craniectomy. The approach to the optic canal is shown, and the frontal lobe has been retracted, and a portion of the bony optic canal unroofed, allowing expansion of the optic nerve and the dural feet. A transethmoidal trans approach. In this approach, uh, it assumes a prominent role for various reasons. The first is obviate the need for craniotomy. The second, this approach requires less time in fashioning and take less time to perform. Uh, the, at third position, uh, this approach tends to be less invasive when performed. One, uh, one made uh, endoscopically. I said, yeah. Sorry. Where, where is actually uh, you? I think it's um, you had the trans admoidal approach, right? Yeah, we are at the trans admoidal approach. Yeah. Yeah, but which one is it? The transficial admoid trans admoidal approach or the trans nasal? Not this one. It is the trans medial approach in the. In all the contexts, but we are not in the special type of this approach. So you can go back to the previous slide. Yeah. On oh, this one. On this one. Yeah. Okay. okay. As we said, uh, the transpendal approach assumes a prominent role for various reasons. And the first is this approach avoids craniotomy. The second one, this approach requires less time in fashioning and take less time to perform. And the third reason, this approach tends to be less invasive when it's made endoscopically and it tends to be uh, like a minimally invasive surgery. But this approach uh, had two main drawbacks. The first one is a risk to injury to the carotid artery and the second is a, a, a cerebrospinal fluid leak. Uh, this uh, cerebrospinal, uh, cerebrospinal fluid leak can be uh, a result of two main reasons. The first reason is according to the removal of the bone over the optic nerve and must be meticulous to avoid injury of the carotid as with the carotid artery, as we said. And uh, second, the optic nerve sheet may be either be lacerated from the traumatic event or assist as a part of the procedure. But uh, such opening in the optic nerve sheet can also lead to a cerebral spinal fluid leak. And as we say, the transethmoidal approach can be divided into transfacial, endoscopic, transnasal, and transconjunctival. And transnasal endoscopic is favored because of the proximity of the optic nerve to the sphenoid sinus, uh, sand, anodi cell, and from some advantages like uh, for external scars. Uh, preservation of olfaction and decreased morbidity and faster recovery time. The next slide, please. Uh, the next slide, please, Arwick. 
Okay. Uh, according to the transfacial exponential approach, it is important to note that the uh, uh, facial incision to major aspect of the obelta apex is the beginning, the beginning point of this surgical approach. And the uh, vertical incision is made medial to the medial cantus. Uh, this we call the lynch incision and allow to divide the medial palpebral ligament. Exposition of the etmoidal sinus by resection of a novel bone near the maxillar etmoidal frontal bones. And the next step is a removal of the mucous membranes and bony septa of the sinus, which is followed by the prominence of the optic canal, which is found deep in the lateral recess of the sinus. And in case of fractures of the thin medial wall of the sinus, the bony fragment should be removed carefully. Uh, it is important to know that the optic canal is decompressed along the medial wall, but the compression of the, opti uh, of the optic canal is, is a subject of many discussion among uh, uh, many authors, and many authors are pointing the uh, they allow to assist the optic nerve sheet, but others are not decided about which, uh, which approach to do accordingly the incision of the optic sheet. But it's important to know that modified uh, sphenoetmoid approach has been extensively described by Soferman to improve the angle of approach. And on this image, it allow us to to show the the left transetmoidal optic nerve the compression. And on the A image, the incision and the area of uh, bone resection are outlined as as we call on the according to the nose. On the image. In the B position, the content of the etmodal sinus are removed and it followed by the optic canal. Then we say is found uh, passing obliquely in the lateral recess of the etmodal sinus and a portion of bony optic canal has been unroofed to allow inspection of the optic nerve and the optic sheet. Uh, the divided medial palpebral ligament is, re is retracted with a suture, uh, as it's shown on this image. Uh, now about the endoscopic transnasal, transnasal, transetmoidal, endoscopic, it began with an, an endoscopic etmoidectomy and then we uh, we alter in the sinus sphenoidal once it is identified. Then we proceed to the examination of the lateral wall of the sinus to find the prominence overlying the optic nerve and the carotid artery. The, it's followed by the a bone removal over the fin lamina papyracea and proceed posteriorly. Drilling should occur uh, should occur under continuous irrigation, and this is important because it's a law to prevent thermal injury to the optic nerve while performing the drilling. The optic nerve sheet may be incised. Uh, as I said previously, this is a debate among authors because some authors are, are agree with the incision of the optic nerve sheet. Some authors are not agree, but others also are undecided accordingly the procedure to do uh, while it is uh, the issue of uh, to incise the optic nerve sheet. But if uh, there is any evidence of the cerebrospinal fluid leak, uh, this, is, uh, this issue should be treated with uh, fibrin glue or dural sub substitute or cadaveric fascia latter. And it is important to note that transconjunctival exposure 
can be used to increase the orbital exposure when performing endoscopic approach and approaches through orbits alone and nasal cavity together increase visualization for this approach. Now we are going to discuss about the, uh, the some studies accordingly to the transethmoidal approach and some authors like Chen and all reported that the endoscopic optic nerve decompression can be safely and effectively achieved via a direct sphenoidotomy which is preferred through the sphenoid ostium in patients with high sphenoidal pneumatization and supersphenoidal atomy or cells. The study involve, involves uh, five cases of traumatic optic neuropathy with uh, a 45 angle, uh, 45 degree angled endoscope used to read the optic nerve canal. Emanuele and all report a relative good risk benefit ratio in patients with uh, post traumatic optic neuropathy when a protocol was follow, followed in which patients receive endovenous steroid therapy and no more than eight hours after entry. With endoscopic endonasal decompression of the intracanicular fragment of the optic nerve performed within two uh, within 12 up to 24 hours after the start of medical treatment. The study involved 26 patients with a maximum uh, 24 one month follow up as a period. Uh, this image show us a lateral wall of the sphenoid when we are uh, decompressing the optic nerve via the it's moidal approach to the transnasal uh, canals. Uh, this image shows that we have a optic nerve and carotid artery, which creates impression on the lateral wall. The carotid artery uh, is uh, posterior and inferior to in relation to the optic nerve. Uh, therefore, we can uh, see on this picture the optic nerve is exposure and should begin anterior and uh, superior in relation of the optic nerve impression. Okay, then we can pass to the second image. Uh, this one uh, shows us an endoscopic acid transorbital for optic nerve decompression. As we said that the conjunctival approaches uh, when we are uh, we are proceeded by the endoscopic transethmoidal approach this conjunctival approach uh, allow us to have a good uh, exposure of the structure and uh, this approach uh, as we said the conjunctival has been fashioned uh, to the periorbital and uh, the careful it, it the dissection of the periorbital should be careful from the orbital wall and ethmoidal artery, cauterize and assist. The lamina papyracea has been removed and uh, drilling had begun to open the optic canal. Uh, as we said in the previous slide, it is important to when we are drilling to prevent the thermal injury, which can occur while drilling, uh, it, it can, uh, this uh, lesion uh, can be uh, localized to the carotid artery. Now we are going to discuss to the last approach, which we call the, last, the lateral approach. Uh, this lateral approach is uh, can be divided into two subcategories. The first one is a, a lateral fascia and the second is a lateral temporal approach that was described in the literature. According to all those approach, uh, there is a vertical or a micronal incision which is performed and limited anterior temporal caniectomy with a removal of the gomatic process which is made. The next step uh, is to this approach allow a dry exposure of the contact 
of the superior orbital fracture and the optic canal through the wide access to the lateral orbit is shown. And the superior aspect of the optic canal can be decompressed and the dual optic sheet can be inspected uh, at the first time, uh, the second time can be incised. As we said, the incision, the incision of the optic, uh, sh the optic sheath can be uh, discussed. Uh, this technique is a high risk for injury to the superior orbital fracture and the carvenous, uh, the carvenous sinus through the extensive exposure of the uh, the extensive exposure of both uh, structures. Uh, this is uh, the first part of this presentation, and uh, I didn't make a conclusion. But the important thing to know, uh, according to the the compression of the optic nerve, this sh should not be performed uh, in all contexts of brain trauma. But the, the compression of the nerve can be uh, performed while we have already done all the evaluation of the optic nerve, uh, the evaluation of the optic neuropathy, uh, which uh, in context of edge uh, injuries, after objective uh, some objective signs such as a visual loss, such as a diminished visual acuity or impaired of acuity. But the first thing to do in case of optic nerve injury is to, to uh, make a treatment based on a corticosteroid uh, uh, therapy, uh, such we can use such uh, medicine like a methylprednisone. Methyl uh, that is the, uh, the main thing to keep according to this presentation and the procedure according to the optic nerve decompression we have three categories the lateral uh, through categorize the transfrontal approach the transethmoidal approach in the transmoidal approach we have many kinds of approaches like uh, the an endoscopic approach like a transethmoidal a transnasal transethmoidal approaches and in last time we have the last uh, the lateral approaches where we are at the end of our presentation we thanks all uh, uh, all we thanks everyone who uh, take time to uh, to hear what we have to present uh, about the the, the, comp the the compression of the optic nerve and we are ready to receive all comments all questions uh, all add accordingly the, according uh, to this subject. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Hassan. Um, mm -hmm. That was a um, uh, great presentation, very detailed and very comprehensive um, altogether. I uh, I think there was more than enough information there. Um, so uh, before I give any comments, I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Meloni uh, and Dr. Uh, Jimo. Um, hi, Dr. Meloni. Um, so I'm sure, I'm sure they'll have a, a, a few a few comments to make there. Um, I'll, I think um, you can start. If you have any comments, Dr. Meloni. Uh, well, first of all, my best appreciation for this uh, panel uh, because uh, touch uh, topics is, is very important in neurosurgery and very discussed the ways uh, the decompression of the optic nerve. Uh, I would just uh, like to how uh, is uh, um, uh, in some techniques uh, it's mandatory to have some endoscopic. Uh, 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 training uh, because not all neurosurgeons are able to do endoscopic uh, uh, above all uh, when you uh, use this approach. We are most familiar, the most part, most familiar with frontal uh, or frontotemporal approach. Uh, just that, uh, but it's absolutely a topic of great interest. So, okay. thank you. Well, um, thank you, um, 
just a reminder, Dr. Meloni is a, a consultant neurosurgeon from the Italy, practices in the north of Italy. Uh, we equally have um, uh, Dr. Jimo, who's a practicing neurosurgeon from Nigeria, but currently in Morocco. Uh, welcome, Dr. Jimo. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Rick, and uh, everybody in the panel. I'm happy to join this uh, panel and to listen to this very important um, um, but rare aspect of neurosurgery. I remember 10 years ago, I had a patient with a optic nerve uh, compression traumatic. And the situation then, it wasn't uh, in the teaching hospital I saw the patient, the situation then could not uh, warrant any surgical intervention. I tried to medically uh, uh, treat the patient by giving a uh, methylprednisolone, but the outcome wasn't particularly uh, very good at the end. Now, I also, do I joined the discussion a bit late. Um, there, are, there is an aspect which is very difficult, the diagnosis actually, because sometimes patients with um, traumatic nerve compression, the time you'll be making the diagnosis might be a bit late because sometimes these patients come uh, unconscious. Uh, by the time they are regaining consciousness, it, it doesn't give you the time to actually think of that very rare pathology for you to assess to see whether they actually have that problem. So it might be giving some, uh, some difficulty in terms of making the diagnosis in the first instance. That's a, so a few, a little experience I've got with this uh, rare uh, pathology. Actually, is the only one that I had come across about 10 years ago, as I said earlier on. So it's fantastic. And uh, I joined Midway. The presenter actually went to town in details uh, to go step by step the principles of uh, management, assessment, and also surgical approaches, even medical aspect of it. That's fantastic. Um, uh, th thanks for your contribution, um, uh, Dr. Jimo. Uh, so, uh, Asen, I I'll just make a few comments on the presentation. Once again, like I said, uh, there are a lot of positive aspects. The presentation was really comprehensive, was really detailed. Um, uh, that's a really great word. It shows that you put in the work, definitely. So, um, a few suggestions. I think uh, these suggestions can help you get your presentation to the next level. So um, first presentation, first um, suggestion is try and get little text on your slides. Don't get everything. Really short text and you can explain. Um, uh, you, you're going to get the opportunity to present uh, international conferences. So you want to get the attention of the audience. And if they can read what you're going to say, then it doesn't help that much. So try and get really short text. Um, more explanations in terms of diagrams. You, you, you spoke about so much anatomy, operative anatomy. So uh, we've been sharing some books in the, in, in the group. Um, and if you don't have them, just let us know so we can send it to you. So when you're explaining some of these things, you can have the images there. Even for yourself, um, as a future neurosurgeon uh, trainee, you, it's good to have those images um, because it's all about anatomy. You need to build up that um, uh, uh, thing. You need to build up that knowledge already. Um, so, so that will help you. Um, there was a time you mistook a CT scan for an MRI. Um, so after this emergency, neurosurgical emergency um, lectures, after this, we're going to go on to neuroimaging. So I think we need to work on that and how you can systematically describe um, uh, some of this imaging. So just, just be careful, just be careful to know the difference. Um, at least at your level, you should be able to know which one is a CT scan, which one is an MRI. The other details, I, I know it's, you're still um, in med school, but the other details will come with time, but at least you should be able to make that um, a difference. And uh, uh, a few times, you, I think this must be just um, a mistake, but you want to be careful. You, sometimes you spoke of optic nerve, sometimes ophthalmic nerve. Um, so don't confuse the two. They're, 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 not, they're not the same, obviously, and I, I think you know that um, probably. Yeah, it was really interesting. Um, that you spoke about reperfusion injury. So I would suggest that when you have time next, when you have time next, you should prepare a really nice uh, presentation on reperfusion injuries and their links to neurosurgical pathologies. Um, I think that would be very interesting for us and for yourself. 
it goes back to some basic science um, and should be really interesting. Um, uh, all together, all together, honestly, uh, really great work. Um, you put in so much effort. Um, we just to push even higher and harder so that you can get something uh, of even better and greater quality so that when you get that chance tomorrow to present at international conferences, you're just at ease. You just feel like you've done this before. Thank you so much. Thank you, Arug, for all comments. And I think uh, in the, I think next time I'll do better than I did uh, for this presentation. And as uh, it was prepared, we should present two topics. The mm -hmm. one which is according to the optic nerve, uh, the compression of the optic nerve, and the second to the, uh, the compression of the uh, fascial nerve. If you can allow, uh, yes. we can put the, the, the next uh, topic for the next Saturday for the presentation to the second part. I don't know if you have already added presentation because I began yeah, sure. the, the presenter, but the, I know the, I, I found the, the, the presentation I sent you. Yes. Uh, there is no this, the second part of this presentation, but in the second presentation, I made some table, uh, some imaging which can explain all, uh, okay. all the things according to these topics. But I, and I think for the next time, I will do better. I, I will. I have to do better than it was now. And thank you for all. Yeah, amazing. Um, thank you so much. Um, yes, definitely next next week, uh, we can have two presentations, one of which will be the second part of the one you presented this time around. Um, uh, and it will yeah. be a good way for you to just apply some of these um, comments and then just get it um, a step further. And really, um, I keep encouraging everyone um, that um, to participate, you, you should all try to uh, do this things um, present because like I said, you're going to be submitting abstracts in conferences. You're going to be presenting these things. And what you want to do is when you go to conferences, there's like 200, 300 people presenting at the same time. And if you want to captivate people, then you need to have that little thing that makes you different from, otherwise everyone just goes, blows past you. So you want to be, you want to be hone that skill. Um, yeah, um, it's really good you're getting into this. Um, thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Alric. Um, is that Marvin? Did you have any comments? You're muted if you can unmute yourself. Yeah, I have some. Well, two questions. Mm. Yeah, the first is I don't know from the presentation, I didn't get a, any consensus about the delay of surgical decompression. He presented two studies, one with seven days, the other three to four days. So is there any consensus about the delay of surgical decompression? Then the second question, well, it's about the approach. He emphasized on, emphasized on uh, the minimally invasive trans -edmoidal, uh, edmoidal approach through endoscopy. Well, uh, I think I want to know if the supraorbital approach isn't better because if the transphenoidal approach, there's a lot of risk of uh, internal carotid artery injury, CSF leakage, whereas with the supraorbital approach, which uh, wasn't mentioned in the, during the presentation, well, those risks are minimized and we have a good exposure about 180 degree of vision, which enable us to, which enable the surgeon to uh, do a safe decompression, removing 50% of the roof of the orbital canal. Mm. Yeah, th thanks for your question, um, Daniel. If you have any, if you have any um, answers, you can go ahead. Otherwise, we can always contribute. There's no worries. Okay, thank Alric. 
uh, according to the first question, uh, for delaying the, the compressive uh, optic nerve compression, uh, some studies sh shows, uh, shown that there is no any difference between performing uh, the compression of optic nerve early and uh, performing the, the compression of the optic nerve uh, after more days, like after seven days. But the fact, uh, the thing which must be, which we must keep in mind, uh, according to the optic nerve injury, uh, in context of uh, edge injury, of uh, in context of trauma, uh, the main uh, the main thing to do is the observation because studies, uh, some literature shows that there is no difference in performing observation alone uh, and. Uh, the uh, don't implementing a treatment accordingly uh, corticosteroid or the compression mm -hmm. according to the mm -hmm. time for delay the compression the, the compression of the optic nerve can be instaurated in context of visual loss as uh, we said in the presentation according to the uh, dimension of the visual acuity and for uh, for patients which develop a visual, uh, which uh, have a visual acuity diminish persistent up to one years, but and I, if I can go through the uh, second question, the we said this trans etmoidal approach is better because this approach is take to uh, it take less time to perform is not need any uh, surgical any great surgical skill uh, but uh, there are many there are two main drawbacks for this uh, surgical approach as we said the leak of cerebral spinal fields and the lesion to the carotid artery uh, that shows that it is important to master the anatomy of the orbital complex and the optic canal. Uh, that is the important thing to know uh, about these approaches. If there are uh, any, there are ads uh, on the on this question, uh, I'm ready to receive. Uh, um, well, thank. I'll just I'll just add, add a few things. So for the first question about um, whether there's a consensus or the management, uh, the very first thing is, like Dr. Jimo uh, said, this is a very rare event. So it's about 2.5% of uh, uh, skull base um, and um, anterior or middle skull base fractures that can be accompanied associated with these traumatic uh, optic nerve injuries. So when you have, every time you have such um, a rare situation it's difficult to have a consensus so usually you're going to have it's going to be based on practice uh, you have someone who's been doing this who's a name in neurosurgery and they will teach it to their residents so obviously you have that's why you have all these divergence if you have more cases then it's easier to have more robust um, scientific studies and then you can base it on it so all the literature you'll find it will be experiences clinical like to tell you it's a single institutional experience we took care of this number of patients and this is what we had and what that means is it's actually about how you practice and how you learn. Because um, if you're in a center where they, they favor, for example, an endonasal approach, say, then obviously you guys at that center will be used to things like um, uh, CSF leak. So you know how to avoid them and you know how to take care of them. If you're, for example, in a low and middle income country, then you don't have that many things to take care of CSF leaks. So you do everything you can to avoid anything that can get you a CSF leak because you're thinking about meningitis and what can happen because you don't have the necessary equipment. So there you can have that discussion, um, um, uh, I think. Uh, about the trans-orbital approach um, versus the supra, uh, I think I'll, I'll defer to Dr. Meloni and Dr. Jimo if they have anything to say about that. Um, Well, I think uh, um, yeah, I know. I I like that. I, I don't have a, a large experience in this topic because, as you just told, Rick is uh, rare. 
uh, but I think that when you uh, perform a supraorbital approach, uh, you're uh, subject to uh, risk of uh, cerebrospinal fluid uh, fistula because uh, you have the frontal sinus. So you, uh, if you perform a supraorbital approach, uh, if you have a large uh, sinus, frontal sinus, uh, you need to cranalize. So uh, you have uh, you uh, face this risk is uh, is intrinsic. Um, uh, personally, um, I think uh, uh, that you need to, first of all, as I just uh, uh, told uh, uh, the colleagues Abdullah, you need to perform a correct diagnosis. Uh, it's very hard sometimes because the patient is in coma. Uh, can be sometimes helpful to, to have, a, 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 I don't know if you agree, a, a fundoscopic exam because you see venous congestion, uh, papilledema, so you have already the suspect uh, uh, and you, if, if it's associated with a CT scan, a bone CT scan that show there is a, a fracture and a, a possible compression in the optical uh, 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 foramen, you uh, you are authorized to uh, check the patients and uh, eventually perform a decompression. Uh, um, if you see there are all this, uh, uh, this finding. Uh, you need also to, uh, to uh, keep uh, in mind the uh, problem of the internal carotid artery. Sometimes you cannot sacrifice the carotid internal artery, so you perform a uh, transphenoidal and you uh, cut the carotid artery. Of course, you put uh, a, a patch, you can uh, control the bleeding if, if it's a nightmare. But, uh, if you have a, 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 a different flow from right to left, left and you sacrifice the, the correct flow, you, I think uh, that you, uh, you worse the medical condition of patients. So you need to, to be very, uh, um, to have a, pay very, uh, a lot of attention when you decide the correct approach. Uh, every approach, I think, uh, uh, has some tricks. Uh, if you have, uh, personally, if you have uh, the opportunity to have more control, perform a, a frontal, uh, frontal temporal approach, uh, it's better, um, no time to have, the, to, to have some uh, uh, minimal invasive or no scare approach. Just uh, take care of uh, of patients uh, and uh, sometimes consider that the patients uh, uh, without uh, um, uh, with a visual defect uh, survive. A patient with an uh, internal carotid artery lesion sometimes cannot survive. Uh, be very careful. That's my okay, um, Dr. Jimo, if you have any comment on that. Uh, okay, uh, Dr. Meloni has actually said comprehensively the the uh, the blind the blind spot of all this management of all this uh, this uh, particular kind of rare injury. Uh, in my own suggestion, uh, like he has partly said, in a setting where you don't have the luxury of uh, all this uh, minimal access or minimally invasive. And in addition, where your, your study, your preoperative image shows that probably there is another injury as well. It is better to go transcreening and to try and sort out all these things at the same time, where you have access and good control of, you know, you, ca you cannot joke around the internal carotid artery. So you be in a position to decompress the optic nerve transcranially and make sure that all the other vascular structures around are equally safe because there is no uh, it's not impossible that as well the other extracular muscle supply the nerves the extracular muscle uh, the uh, the kilometer the trochlear and all that could equally be in the harm's way going transcranial and microscopically of course uh, which is easily <laughs> accessible to even if you don't have the standard operating microscope, you could have a good magnification loop that you could use to really sort out this thing meticulously. Other than um, 
of course, this presentation is very important. We all get the all the scope of the treatment options surgically, but uh, in this regard, as uh, asked by Dr. Marvin, you have to be in a position to take control of everything practically. In the, and in this our environment, you have to go transcranial to make sure all the anatomy is clear and you do what you want to do and get out. That's my suggestion. Um, thank you so much. Uh, that was very enlightening. Uh, Dr. Marvin, are you satisfied with the, with the answers? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, well, well, thank you so much. Um, thank you for, for attending. Uh, thank you, Asen, for a really brilliant presentation. Uh, we'll say to next week, we have another presentation. Thank you so much. Yeah, okay. Thank you.